Okay, so I'm going to start off with the first lightning share out. And this comes to you by way of my love for gadgets. So I'm a gadget person. I love anything technology, except when it comes to educational technology, I generally am really skeptical because it hasn't worked well many times for me in the past. However, there are certain things when I, when I try them and when they work that I think, oh my gosh, maybe this is changing my mind. And so I'm going to share with you something about how maybe we can use technology, especially these tools that let us synchronously work together to create new ways of interacting together in spaces like classrooms. Okay, so I'm gonna go through a couple of different examples with you. Um, if you want to participate, it would be fun if you did. You will wanna pull out your computer or your phone, smartphone that has some internet enabled thing, and I'll tell you when you're ready, we're ready to have you participate. Okay, <clears throat> so um, let me start with a uh, not math example. So everyone here at Harvey Mudd, the students at least, take a, everyone takes a first year writing course. And a lot of us teach this first year writing course. Um, Rachel has taught one with me. Um, when we do this, I typically have something like a, a best sentence makeover contest in class. Um, and here's what happens. We open a Google Doc, and every student in class pastes into the Google Doc the sentence that they hate the most in their current draft of their essay. And then what we do is everybody gets their own sentence sort of exposed on a separate page of the document, and then everybody in the class at the same time is going through, looking at all the other sentences, and writing revisions to those sentences. So we spend about 20 minutes, everybody's furiously making edits to every, uh, everybody else's sentences. And after about 20 minutes or so, everyone has about like six or so different edits. And then the person whose sentence it was goes back, looks through the suggestions, comes up with her own suggestion, or if they like one that was really, really good, they vote on that one as their favorite. And that person wins the sentence makeover contest. So this is what happens in our class, you know, so you, this is sort of like simulated version, but like people are like putting in their edits and then someone decides, oh, I like that one the best. Oof, and then the highlight appears. So that's just a, a simple example of how that synchronous editing ability makes a way for us to all work together in a way that's much more efficient. It'd be a lot maybe more standard if I just put one sentence on the board and we all wrote on, on, worked on it at the same time, but that wouldn't be as, as fun or as quick as doing 16 different sentences at, all at the same time. Um, and what's really interesting too is people are working generally silently, but then whenever two people sitting next to each other happen to be on the same sentence, they notice that they're on the same sentence and they start collaborating because they're of their proximity. And so you have this interesting multi-level effect where we're all working in a virtual space, but that virtual space has another layer of um, physical contact and personal conversation that happens at the same time. Here's a second example. I teach a um, course for pre-service teachers, uh, pre-service mathematics secondary teachers, and in that class we use video quite a lot to analyze our own practice and to learn how to notice different things in each other's classrooms. So one of the things that we do in this class is we watch a lot of these video artifacts from each other's classes. So for example, on the right is a still from a class. What we do is at the same time, we have a Google Doc open and every person in the class has a different cell in this Google Doc table and they're furiously typing in what they notice at the same time. So we're watching the video live, we hear the audio from the video, but we're also typing, we see each other's notes, but then there's also talking that happens and this is natural, I don't, I don't suggest that they do that, but they just do it anyway. So people are making comments, oh my gosh, did you see that? That was so funny, ha ha ha. And that's happening, but we're also typing, and then we're also watching a video at the same time. So this is really interesting, multimodal way of interacting with each other that I'm noticing happening. And what's really interesting about the way that this happens is that if I just had a conversation, let's discuss what you saw in the video. What you typically see is that the people who are outgoing or talk a lot, talk a lot. 
and you don't always get every voice heard. But with this sort of interaction, everyone's voice is heard. I notice that people are much more likely to talk in class after they have this experience rather than maybe before. Okay, so here's one more quick one. This is a math one. Um, if you have your phone or your computer, go to that URL. Okay, there are about 100 people in this room. Anybody want to guess what is the likelihood that two people in the room will have the same birthday? I'm not saying year, but month and day. Okay. Is it very likely, unlikely, 50-50? Very likely. Okay, maybe you already know the punchline. There's a lot of math people in the room. Okay, but well how about three people in the room having the same birthday? Yeah, okay, you, so I think a lot of, if you walked, to, walked up to a person uh, who wasn't very mathy or thought about this a lot, you would think like, oh, there's 100 people, there are 365 days, so the chances that two people have the same birthday would be like maybe a third. Well, it turns out that um, if you just picked 100 people off the street, the chance that two people don't have the same birthday is three in 10 million. Okay, so it should be very likely two people have the same birthday. So if you're already on the bit.ly link, it's a Google spreadsheet. Follow the instructions there. You're supposed to find your birthday, change the date for your birthday to blue if it's not been blue yet. If it's blue, change it to green. If it's already green, change it to red. Okay, so now we're watching to see if we have any greens. Is that a green? Is March 5th a green? October 12th is purple. I don't know. People, are you following the instructions? Purple is not blue or red. How do you change the color? On the toolbar, there's an icon like that. Click on that and then change the color. Okay, if, yeah, if, you have, if you're using a smartphone, it might be a little more challenging, so. Okay, we have a green, July 12th, yay. I'm really surprised nobody's birthday is coming up in January, really? Thank you so much. Now, before we have our next person come up, so I, I did that share out. Um, I had an ulterior motive for doing that. I also wanted you all to try something else because we need to vote on what topics we want to discuss on this afternoon. So now what I want you to do is if you have your smartphones or your computers, please go to this URL. Okay, so when you get there, the question that you're responding to is, what topics would you like to discuss in the afternoon? So this is free, free to Type in a word or a short phrase. And once you do, other people's options will show up, and you will get a chance to vote on the ones that you like. You actually get to vote plus one or minus one. Let's be nice and not vote minus ones on people's ideas, okay? Boo, hey! Okay, you can minus one that one. If you're looking at the list of, of suggestions, you'll notice that there are two categories, new and top. 
Okay, so if you're looking for one and you can't find it, you might be looking at the ones that were new, like just recently entered, or top, the ones that are getting the highest votes. You might want to. Sure, sure. Let's do that. Let's do, how about that? That's a great suggestion. So everyone right now, just add your ideas, and then we'll switch to voting. Okay, now let's switch to voting. So if you haven't already voted yet, or if you want to vote more, go ahead and vote on the topics that resonate most with you. And again, these are topics that we're going to devote a whole room to, and you're going to go into the room of your choice at 3.30 to have a conversation about the topic that you want to. Okay, maybe some consolidation will have to occur. Tell me if you need 30 seconds more or 60 seconds more or nothing left. Okay, you get 30. All right, how about while that's going, let's give our attention to Larissa Schroeder, who is our next lightning share out speaker. Hi, so I'm Larissa Schroeder from the University of Hartford, and I've been teaching in clip classrooms for about um, three and a half years now. And what I actually want to share with you is a takeoff on uh, a minute paper, and I call it a more than a minute paper for a very good reason. How many people have heard of minute papers before? Okay, so the traditional minute paper, right, you just ask students what they've learned, or, and then what's the muddiest point, what are they most conf confused about? Um, I do a variation on that for my classes. Um, and really, the, the purpose behind this is something called um, formative assessment for learning. So um, my background, you have to understand, is that I am a PhD in education, mathematics education specifically. And so for formative assessment for learning, we're really designing prompts um, that are helped. They're designed to promote learning and not to evaluate students' learning. So they're not, they're not a test or a quiz. My students do not get grades for these things. They're intended to provide feedback for both the students and me as the instructor. And I use them heavily to alter, um, to alter instruction for my students, either at that time in class or more likely for the subsequent class. So what do I do for more than a minute paper? This is an example of one of the things I give my students. And this, oftentimes it's something that I've just handwritten up on um, 
on my slide deck before we start class. Usually they're only handwritten and not more formal because I also have a formative assessment process that I use to, um, for the students' work they do outside of class before coming into the class. They've got to submit something and tell me, ask, answer some questions and also tell me what questions they have. So I have an idea of where I want this question to go before I get there, but it's not soon enough for me to type it up and make it look pretty. And the basic idea is my students work in small groups, usually of two or three. I teach in a classroom where I have movable tables, I have three projective surfaces, and I have 13 to 16 classroom iPads. So my students will do these on the iPads with a partner, and then they'll email them to me. They really serve two purposes. One is to get them talking again with each other and to get some feedback from their peers and to get feedback from me. It also provides a way for them to summarize the class. One of the common complaints, if you want to call it that, from my flip courses, the students don't have notes like they're used to. I teach first year students. They don't have a note, they have a notebook, but they don't have me standing at the board saying, you do this and then this and then this and it's in their notes. So this gives them an opportunity to try to synthesize what we've been doing in class. And since I mail it back to them, they also should get a, um, something for their notes. I'm not sure how this is going to work or how much sound we're going to have, but I want to show you what this looks like in my classroom. So please notice, I'm a really diverse class. So as you see, as you look around the classroom, all the students are, are actively engaged. They're all talking with each other at this. At one point, one of the girls was going like this, trying to slice through her solid and talking with her partner there. So they're in the process of trying to make sense of what we've just been doing in class. They're going to write it down on the iPad. They're going to email it to me. I get to look at it. I get to then send it back to each of the individual students and give them some feedback about what they've been doing, what they may or may not understand. And oftentimes, I ask them at the end, do you have any questions? So again, why do I do this? It really provides an opportunity for students to synthesize or, or summarize their work and it gets them to engage in the mathematics. They get to ask questions. They get feedback again. Not, not that they don't get a lot of feedback from me during class, but now they get me get something back from me personally. And they, um, it, gives, so it gives me opportunities to identify what they do and don't understand and make adjustments for subsequent lessons. And in case you don't have piles of iPads running around, I actually also do this on half sheets of paper as well. Very quick, grade them. Not grade them, but look at them, give comments, and, and send them back. So that's my teaching tip. Thank you. And now we're going to welcome Sarah Clifton. Oh, no, sorry. Nope, sorry, I was out of order. Sorry. Beth McClanahan. All right, thank you guys for being patient. Um, I'm Beth McClanahan, I'm from LaGrange College in LaGrange, Georgia. I've been flipping the classroom for about two and a half years, almost three years. So I noticed that the top thing over there that people wanted to hear about were horror stories. Um, I don't have horror stories necessarily, but I do think I have 
I've been doing this and figured out what doesn't work or how to go about some issues that I've encountered when flipping the classroom. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what happens when this happens or what, what you can do to, to fix th problems that might occur. Um, so the first thing that happens to me, I don't know if it happens to you, but I have a hard time getting students to do homework outside of class. Does that happen to anyone? Really? So it's not just me. Okay, so no matter what the homework is that I assign them, I have a hard time getting them to do the homework outside of class. So now that I've made the homework being watching the videos, I have a hard time getting the students to watch the videos. So um, that's my first issue, is challenge number one. Students do not watch the videos. I feel like I'm in a tennis match trying to field all these things that keep happening in my flipped class. So I can't get them to watch the video just like I couldn't get them to do the homework before. So what do you do when the student doesn't watch the video that you've worked so hard on? So the biggest thing that has helped me here with watch, getting students to watch the videos and, and having students have notebooks that have notes in them is to give an, a quiz at the beginning of class each day. So I post the video, they have to watch the video, they take notes on the video. Their notebooks are beautiful now, by the way. They come to class and they take an open notes quiz on the video at the beginning of class. So that's the, this gives me a way of knowing what they know already and assessing them a little bit before, before an actual test too. So when I'm walking around the classroom, I already know who doesn't understand the material based on grading these quizzes. So I can kind of focus a little bit more attention on those students as well. and. Um, you know, some students are not as willing to ask questions, and I know that I need to go spend more additional time with students who aren't doing as well on the quizzes, but I have been surprised that their notebooks this semester have looked so much better after giving these open notes quizzes. Um, so they, they actually can read their notebooks and everything. So that's, our, that's my solution to the students not watching the videos. Um, I know that sometimes people embed quizzes in the videos, and I haven't done that yet because I am just not technologically advanced enough to do that, but this is kind of my low-tech way of getting them to watch the videos. The second thing that I've had happen is class attendance. Um, again, I don't know if anybody else struggles with this or if it's just me. Um, sometimes our students feel like they just don't need to come to class, and especially now that the video's online, they're like, oh, I can learn everything I need to learn at home, and I don't need to come to class because I don't need her help. Um, when they really do need my help. I teach all remedial math courses. All of them need my help, I promise. So I need them to come, um, but our, I do, all of our homework that I give is actually online as well. Um, we've tried doing a completely online class, and with my level of student, it was a complete disaster. So I need them to come to class so that I can help them. Um, and, and the biggest way I've done that is the same thing with the daily quizzes. Um, that counts towards their grade, so obviously if you give a quiz every day, that's in class. Hopefully that's another way. And then the second thing I've done is to limit class, um, the assignment access. I do, um, we use WebAssign for our homework grading tool. And so I make it where the class, the assignment opens at the beginning of class and it closes at the end of class unless the student is still working on the assignment at the end. If they are still working, then I'll extend it for that student. But, but I only have a small window of time for it to be open so that they can't just sit in their dorm room and do it whenever they want. I want them in my classroom working on it when I can help them. That's the whole idea behind the course. So um, limited assignment access is my way of dealing with that challenge. And then the third challenge I was going to deal with was the student-teacher ratio. I'm only one person, so walking around the class and helping this many students all at once, if there are so many questions happening all at the same time, was so sort of difficult if I had above 15 students maybe. Um, so the, the couple ideas I've dealt with with this is one, getting a TA. If you have a class size above 15 to 20 students, it's probably helpful to have somebody else who can walk around and answer questions. And then the other thing that I'm gonna start implementing this semester is some sort of partner collaboration where before you raise your hand and ask me a question, you're gonna ask your partner first and see if, if that will help me be able to help more people, but also the students be able to explain things to, to other students, because that's a great way of teaching as well. And those are my challenges. I don't know if, I'm sure there are others, but they're not really horror stories, but I've had things happen um, with, especially with not, when I had no way of assessing whether the students were watching the videos or not, that was not good. So you have to make sure you have some way to do that. That's all.
All right. In the interest of time, maybe we'll just do one more today, and then we will continue tomorrow. Hi, I'm uh, Sarah. I'm from. I'm a graduate student at Northwestern University right now, and I just wanted to share a few tips for teaching the introverted student. I'm sure this is very relevant to this this group here. Um, uh, at first, I was I was skeptical about uh, flipped classrooms. I'd only ever been in I would say poorly implemented flipped classrooms, um, and so I. I was never going to implement this until I read an article by Susan Cain. Susan Cain is, I'm, I'm sure some of you have heard of Susan Cain. Um, she uh, wrote an article, How to Teach the Introverted Student, and she suggested that uh, flipped classroom might help, and I did a 180, and I am now willing to consider it. <laughs> so with that in mind, I will uh, uh, say why I've changed my mind. Um, so first off, who are these introverted students, um, and why should we care about them? Uh, they are a large part of our classroom, and I suspect for STEM, it's even higher than 30 to 50 percent. So they, they are a huge part of our classroom, so we, we, should, we should really care about them. Um, and they're the ones that, that sit in the class, and they usually think slowly through problems. They're usually reluctant to raise their hands, um, and they just like a lot of time to think things through quietly. Um, and I, I, want, I think there's a, a perception that Introverted students are somehow shy or, or socially uh, anxious somehow or insecure. And I, I hope that it, at the very least you leave thinking uh, that that is not true. Uh, introverted students actually have different brains. They respond to stimulation differently. So um, uh, they're not the shy students. They just need more time to think things through. Uh, so with that in mind, Tips for teaching introverts. I'll just—I just have three that she has suggested. These are not my ideas. Uh, first is the the flipped classroom. At first, it seemed counterintuitive to me that um, a flipped classroom could help. I mean, you spend more time in class, interacting with your peers, with group work. Uh, but really, what it does is it buys them time to learn the material at their own pace and come in confident that they know how it works and they're more willing to share that way. Second is uh, think fair share. Everybody's familiar with that. Um, I, I suspect Piglet is actually an introvert. Um, <laughs> so if, if you were going to ask the whole class a question, uh, Piglet would not raise his hand to answer it. He's, he's probably smart, but he's not going to answer the question because that's not in his nature. But if you give him time to think about it and then only open up to poo, he'll be much more comfortable. And then the, the confident pair can, can open up to the entire class. And finally, uh, I think this is actually the most important to me, is to rethink what we mean by participation. Usually our classes have some sort of participation points in it, and I'm not, I'm not convinced, at least for with working with my colleagues, that this is, we're actually grading what we want to be grading with participation. Um, it's, I, I, a lot of my colleagues, they uh, seem to think that like raising your hand and speaking is how you should get your participation points, but this is this is definitely not comfortable for most introverts, even though they are participating. So, for instance, in this classroom right here, in the traditional sense, one person is getting a participation point right now, but for the rest of them, they're all engaged. You can tell they're all engaged. I would be lucky to have this classroom. They're all staring and and they're all thinking things through, um, and I, so I think they should all be getting engagement points if that's what we're talking about. <laughs> And so that, uh, there's lots of different ways that um, introverts prefer to get their participation points. And uh, thinking quietly, actively engaging, but not necessarily speaking would be helpful. And also, online participation is much easier for introverts. They can think things through before they type in a comment and help out. Uh, so th those are my, my tips. And in five minutes, I can't really go over all of them, but this is a bunch of Susan Cain's work on uh, helping out introverts, uh, and I would love to talk about this afterwards with anyone. Um, I'm Sarah Scott. I'm from Framingham State University, and um, I teach nursing. And our classes are hybrid or blended. We're kind of confused about what that term is, kind of after this conference, not being really sure. But we teach um, RNs who have come back to school to get their baccalaureate. And the way it principally goes is half our classes are online and half our classes are face-to-face. -face. 
And when we meet, the classes are long, they're four hours. So that I try to create a lot of activities to mix it up. And um, I was thinking um, since yesterday's presentation on um, introverts, I was thinking about how that applies to this um, exercise. But what I do in a lot of cases is I do something that we call shark tanking. And we figure out the students come in having prepared. And um, then we sit down and I give them a scenario to use what they've read about. And in tip typically the class is the Board of Health. We try to, and they have to compete for funding, and the class votes on what project they would fund. So that's kind of how it fits the shark tanking mindset. For us, um, we teach, um, our curriculum is organized around a public health mindset. So we talk a lot about public health principles in our nursing classes. And the two examples I'm just gonna show you really quickly are from my informatics class. I teach nursing informatics to RNs. So again, we just look at things so typically, um, they would come up with a public health um, topic that they need, they feel needs to be reinforced to the general public on um, a regular basis. Once they decide upon it, they tell me um, what the topic is so we don't have redundancy. I, um, the students, I, they always have to mix up the groupings. So I, you know, I encourage them to go to people they don't know in the class. As the class goes on, they tend to know each other anyway, but in the beginning, it's good for them to, to mix it up. And um, they choose one or more of the media tools that um, we've talked about, they've read about, and apply a public health message to it. And it's really interesting, because they have to tentatively come up with a budget. And I walk around you know, in the class the whole time, so I'm able to see who might be the introvert who's really strong at budgeting, and one other person, when they get up to present, maybe presents it, but people's strengths, I can evaluate them. Oh, sorry. Um, I can evaluate them um, in that way. So sometimes they've come up with ideas like looking at delivering their public health message, like in a gas station, you know, when you're pumping gas, and there's that little thing that says, join the grocery store um, um, agreement that we have so you get five cents off or 10 cents. Well, delivering a, a public health message, you know, have you gotten your flu vaccine? when you're in line in the grocery store and you're looking at a screen that might say, um, again, that sometimes when you're ringing your groceries up or you know, delivering a little message about hand washing. Did you wash your hands before you came into the grocery store? You know, have you gotten your flu vaccine? Are you HPV or shingles vaccinated? You know, any of those kinds of things. And it really, they, it, it just, in a four hour class, causes people to mix it up, it causes them, and they really get competitive, which is kind of funny. So it's, it's really a, it turns out to be a good um, exercise. Another one is, this was another one for the same class, your coordinator for a public health office in your state. As you visit um, the health departments, you are see that you're confronted with a seeming increase in sexually transmitted diseases in 15 to 19 year old females. So again, as a group, they figure out how they're going to substantiate their findings. Address the clinical issue. What would be your initiative? And they have to use some of the tools that we've been reading about that week in the class. Um, who, who are the key partners? And again, I think this makes them kind of integrate it and move it outward. And then again, present your class, present to the class. Who would be your funding board, your approval board? And it gives students an interesting opportunity to look at interventions. And some of them, you know, they start out being really basic, but then as they get competitive and they realize their peers are gonna come up with some really interesting and creative ideas, they then do the same thing. So it's, um, it's, it's turned out to be a great opportunity, especially early in a class when I'm trying to get them to work together and get to know each other. And it can be used in a number of different ways. So it's been a great, it's been a really successful exercise for me. Thank you. Thanks, Anne-Marie. Next, we have Jennifer Clinkenbeard. Good morning. My name is Jennifer Clinkenbeard. I am a math teacher at Cal State Fullerton and as I've talked with many of you, I'm also working on finishing up my PhD in math education here at Claremont Graduate University. 
I wanted to share a little bit with you guys about my experiences in my flipped college algebra and pre-calculus classes at Cal State Fullerton. Uh, notably, our use of a pre-assessment in the course redesign. So the way that these courses were redesigned at Cal State Fullerton was actually a three-part flip model. Usually when we talk about the flip class, we are cognizant of the material that's done at home, either via video lecture or some other type of dissemination, and then the in-class problem-solving lab. At Cal State Fullerton, uh, when, this course, or when these courses were redesigned, we added a additional component, which we call ticket in the door. So this is a pre-assessment, basically just a short assignment that that student is required to complete before class. So kind of the cycle of these courses. So online modules are very, very short, seven to 12 minutes, and they have embedded questions in them actually, which is quite nice, like little multiple choice things to where it tracks the student's participation in the module. The student then has to do the ticket on the door, the short assignment before they come to class. And then during classes, the mathematics labs, which as we've all talked about in this conference, uh, you know, the students are doing a lot of problem solving. And for us, it tends to be heavy on student presentation of their work and their solutions also. So I wanted to focus today on that ticket in the door, tell you a little bit about how we've implemented it, and perhaps give you a few suggestions if this is something that is interesting to you, how it could be used in your class as well. So here's an example of a ticket in the door assignment. Uh, I split it up so, so, so that you guys can see it. Uh, it's basically like a very short quiz format thing, usually three to five questions that align with the information that was presented in the video module. So this is on a section, linear versus exponential functions. If you uh, do not teach math, it's you know just sort of a basic thing that you would see in a college algebra course. And you'll notice these questions tend to be a little bit more procedural. So it has some built-in scaffolding that the student is doing what we might consider the easier problems independently before they come to class. A couple of options you might do if you're thinking, oh my gosh, I already had to record all these videos, now I have to write quizzes to go with every section too, <laughs> uh, would be a couple options would be using old quizzes from previous semesters, or if your publisher provides some materials, basically any supplemental material that is aligned with the section could go along as a pre-assessment. You could also use different types of activities. We've usually done this quiz type thing, but you could do some reflective writing or concept mapping, something to show that the student was really engaging while they were watching that video. So how this fits into the flipped class, as I said, before class, the student is expected to do this pre-assessment taken in the door. It actually opens up, becomes available to them when they finish the video module. So once they have completed, clicking through, watching it answer the questions, then the assignment opens. This is actually relatively easy to do in Moodle, uh, and I'd be happy to talk to you about that. You could also just make it freely available, you know, download this and work on it while you're watching the video. The student is expected to print out the ticket in the door and attempt the problems before class. I say attempt because they're not perfect. And I think this is actually a strength of this particular teaching technique because it teaches them that it's okay to be wrong. They get their points as long as they have attempted all of the problems. And if there are things written down that are wrong, it's okay. You're not penalized for it at all. And so a couple of options for accountability. You know, how do you know they actually did it before class? Well, you can either just check them real quick at the beginning of class via a stamp, or one thing I've actually done that works quite well is asking them to submit it online. They take a quick picture on their smartphone, Submit it, you can check the timestamp later to make sure it was actually turned in before class. So that's actually a pretty quick type thing. And then during class, the class begins with the student presentations of their work. We've spent some time at this conference talking about, so you flipped your class, now what do you do during your class time? This provides a nice starting point for a class discussion that's based on work the student has done at home. So there's a few different options for presentations. My favorite is usually the doc cam. I'll have one student come up, put their ticket in the door assignment under the doc cam and explain their work line by line to their fellow students. They're often wrong and that's okay. And the fellow students and I, we all work together to fix it. Uh, you can also just do a small group share out. It's always a good way to go or if uh, on the days that my doc cam wasn't working well, you can just have them write their solutions on the board, it's fine too. 
So there's a lot of ways for them to present this work. I like this because it forces them to verbalize their problem solving and to synthesize their solution into words to explain to one another. So some benefits that I feel come from embedding this particular activity as a regular daily thing in the flipped class, it makes them uh, think about the material right after watching the video, as opposed to maybe they watch the video, they wander away, they come to class the next day and go, I don't remember what was in the video. Why would you expect me to remember what was in the video? <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> I think it helps them to kind of have a, a, a product that goes along with that time that they spent. It's a consistent place to begin the class discussion. As I said, uh, I and I'm sure many of you would do a lot of different things during that class time in the flip class. So on some level, they're not exactly sure, you know, what are we going to be doing when we come in today? So this is a nice place to start where they know, all right, we're going to start with ticket in the door. We're going to present it. I'm going to be able to get all of the right answers, fix my ticket in the door based on other people's presentations. Then we'll go on and do something else. It has the built-in scaffolding that I mentioned that you can assign some of these more procedural problems to where your problem solving time during class is the uh, longer, more word problem type things. Uh, it forces the students to practice written responses. I don't know if a lot of you do this, but our uh, college algebra pre-calc classes do their homework online. Who's a lot of people-ish? And I feel this is helpful because when we test them, when we assess them, it's written, right? And so the homework modality is not necessarily consistent with how we're testing them. And so uh, this gives us an opportunity to get them to practice writing these solutions when they will not necessarily get that in the homework. And also, as I mentioned earlier, getting used to writing down things that are wrong and being OK with that and going back and fixing it, I think is a very powerful thing that these students are not used to being OK with. So and these are somewhat anecdotal just based on my own experience. But I, in my opinion, I thought this would be something that would be easily applicable to a lot of your classes. And that's why I wanted to share it today. Some comments on this. Now, normally on the like reviews and things, students don't just talk about ticket to the door. They talk about lots of things. But once in a while, they say something about it. And generally, it's a positive feedback. We've talked some about getting student pushback. When you try and flip a class, you're going, what? Why am I doing this? And so this seems to be a piece that they can latch onto. It's in their locus of control, and they tend to feel pretty good about it. So it's just some things that they said, um, not corrected for spelling or grammar. Uh, that generally this is positively received, and I know for me as a teacher, it also provides a nice structure to my flipped class in class time. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Our next presenter is Samantha Eastman. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? My name is Samantha Eastman, and I'm an instructional design analyst at UC Riverside. And uh, I oversee the clicker support on campus. And um, this is an example of our historical use in unique courses. Um, and you can see here that there are 368 unique courses that have implemented clickers since its inception at UCR in 2006. So uh, what we're seeing here is the spectrum across the colleges and schools. The top five colleges or schools to adopt clickers are uh, sociology, economics, business, biology, and physics in that order. So uh, it is a mix of the science and humanities. Um, so what we're 
finding is that among the instructors at UCR that the clicker adoption is kind of a low thre threshold technology, um, kind of a gateway technology to uh, adopting additional technologies. It's a way to encourage participation and engagement in the classroom, especially among students who are not um, very outgoing or don't want to talk in public. So you have the benefit of the anonymity for student participation. And that also provides kind of a segue among instructors into um, investigating different ways to encourage engagement and participation in the classroom. Uh, how many of you here have implemented clickers, have any experience with clickers? Okay. So um, the ones that we use look like this. They're the HIT system. Uh, and we're also finding that some of the instructors are wanting to adopt web-based um, polling software like Top Hat. Um, we're also experimenting with the gamified version of Kahoot. Um, but we're encouraging instructors to use this mostly for low-stakes participation credit. And we're finding that students are very conscientious about their participation credit, even if it's only 5% of their grade. So um, another thing is that it encourages attendance because if students want their participation credit, they have to come to class to um, use their clickers in class to get that. And um, I wanted to show you a short video. This was uh, recorded because we had an opportunity earlier in the fall to talk to our 1954 founding class when UCR evolved from a citrus experiment station to a college of letters and sciences. Um, we had some of the alumni return and we wanted to show them what technology in the classroom looks like. And we found that because we're from faculty technology support that we were kind of missing the student voice. And so we went out and did some man on the street interviews with students. And one of the questions that we asked was, if you had any recommendations or advice for your instructors, uh, what would it be? And this one student wanted to talk about clickers. So I just wanted to share that with you before I close. recommend anything it's the use of uh, clickers you take quizzes or um, you, there's polls so we get like that immediate feedback on the screen so what I really like about that is that um, some professors not all they use those for attendance and that's a good way to get people uh, to attend class especially if it's part of our grade our participation grade so it's a really good way to motivate people to go to the class and stay focused and it's another good way to get immediate feedback on how the class is doing as far as the material. Because if a class, the majority of the class doesn't understand something and we um, take a clicker question, for example, and the majority of the class fails it or um, they don't know what's going on, it gives the teacher or the professor a good idea of where the class stands and what materials they need to go over a little more. And that's really helpful so we can focus on the things that we need more help on and not focus so much on the things we already kind of know. So I just wanted to add that um, instructors can be creative with the types of questions that they ask. They can be predictive questions, analytical questions. Uh, they can be questions that don't necessarily have a correct answer something to encourage discussion and dialogue in the classroom. So um, oftentimes we'll suggest that maybe you could consider dividing your class, getting a demographic view. Using the software that we have at UCR, students immediately see a graph showing the distribution of responses. And they're often very curious and interested in what their peers have said and where they stand in relation to their peers. So um, that's another benefit to using them. Thank you.
All right, I'd like to uh, invite Magesh Chandramuli to come up. And as he does, I just wanted to say something to you. So when I've done these lightning share outs in previous conferences, it's usually more like an informal experience. People come up and say something. You guys have been amazing that everyone has come up so far has been really polished with PowerPoint slides and all of that. And so I just wanted to say that's been amazing, but equally amazing is someone who's just willing to come up and share something. So I just wanted to say that so that Magesh doesn't feel funny about not having slides. <laughs> Go ahead, Magesh. Okay. Um, everyone hear me? Okay. Um, so thanks for that intro. That was something that I was going to say myself. Um, so this is not what I'm going to share is not flipped classroom per se. And I told Rachel that I don't have anything prepared, and I don't have any presentation. I don't have any material to show. We, we just had this talk yesterday, but she still encouraged me to go ahead and share my experience. So if this is bad, she is to be blamed. <laughs> okay. So uh, my name is Magesh Chandramauli. I'm a faculty in computer graphics at Purdue University Calumet. I primarily teach undergraduate courses and graduate courses in computer graphics involving 3D modeling, animation, uh, digital lighting, digital rendering. And in my undergrad courses, typically, there is both mid-semester examination and final examination. So over the past few years, what I have been experimenting is, instead of me administering the mid-semester examination, I have handed it over to the students. And contrary to what I believed, it actually increased my workload tremendously. <laughs> so this is informed to the students very well in advance. It's included in their syllabus. And this is what I discuss in the first day of class, which I did not do because I'm here. So I'll do it tomorrow when I get back. Um, so the students are clearly informed about this. So they are very well aware of this exercise so that they can start preparing for it right from the beginning. And it will include all the materials that have been covered from the beginning to the mid-semester, like spring break or fall break. And teams are formed. And I use my own software to create the scenes. But yesterday, somebody told me about Piazza or something like that. So I'll go ahead and try that. So just to make sure that like one of the speakers earlier mentioned how to form teams in such a way that students who are always sitting in one corner never mingle with others. So the randomness mostly ensures that the groups get across. And the students also take weekly quizzes. Like in my courses, every week they have quizzes based on the materials covered earlier. So they don't have much um, questions about the format of the questions themselves, because they are taking it on a week by week basis. So Starting from week one, they, the teams are assigned right in the first week. So they start working with their teams on the questions. And from one of the comments that they gave at the end and even during, they seem to clearly realize that making meaningful questions is far more difficult than answering them. So in order to make these questions, you really have to be attentive in class. And you have to make sure, because if they are there and they are asking a question, that is not correct, then the other team will be awarded the point. But there's three to four weeks before the actual quiz starts, they have to email me the draft. And this draft, I will look at it, and I will provide them the feedback. And they work on that for a couple more weeks while adding questions all along. And two weeks before the actual quiz, I sit with each team, and I go through their questions. And I tell them which one of them are wrong, and more importantly, why they are wrong. So this eliminates any ambiguity, any kind of questions that might arise during the actual day of quiz, because the lectures are normally one hour and 50 minutes long. And I try to complete it in one class, but sometimes it might spill over. So the more mistakes we eliminate during the initial reading of phase, the smoother it will be during the actual quiz. So then the teams would go against each other. So normally, there might be five to six teams. And there is no winner or anything like that. So that takes a bit of pressure off them. Each team would get to ask questions two times and answer questions two times. So team A and team B 
there will be 20 questions that team A asks to team B and 20 questions that team B asks to team A. So each team would get to go two times and get to answer. They would ask questions two times and answer two times. The average would be counted as the midterm score. So the past three years, this is the third year. It's been going pretty well. And I can also see that their understanding has improved a lot from their scores in the final exams. Also, in the student evaluations that they provide finally, um, of course, there will always be um, some who are not comfortable with it. And that's very important because that helps me understand what's wrong with that and improve it every semester. But by and large, students seem to enjoy it because, one, they say that it takes the pressure off them because it's not a midterm examination per se. And two, because of their involvement, they learn a lot. They are contributing to it. They are not just answering it, but they are developing the questions that requires them to have more deeper understanding of the material. Okay, so that's uh, pretty much it. Thank you very much. And thank you for bearing with this impromptu presentation. Well, if you can call that a presentation. Yes. Yes, actually, that's a very good question. Some of the students asked me if they, we can do one before the final exam. Uh, the problem is to be able to find the time for preparation, because there is a lot of preparation that goes into this. Towards the finals week, there are already complaints that we have final project and final exam coming together at the same time, so I try to space them apart. So now I haven't figured out a way how to do this that way, uh, but still, what some students did was they get to form study groups because of this, and they continue that exercise in the libraries. And I personally saw this a couple of times when, because they can reserve those individual study rooms in the libraries. And some of them said that they did it. So the next semester, I went in and saw they actually did it. So that was a nice thing. But I don't know how I can do this towards the finals, because those periods are extremely stressful for us as well as the students. So I don't know how I can do this over the finals. Yes. Yes. They did. they did. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Magesh. Could I invite Rick Olson? I'm using PowerPoint only as a memory aid. I'm Rick Olson. I'm from the University of San Diego, not to be confused with San Diego State or UC San Diego. Um, and so this is just a quick top 10 list of things that popped into my mind. Um, some of them have, are directly related to flipping classes. Others are just things that we should be doing. Uh, the first is we all know that we should always be creating uh, learning objectives and maybe even sharing them with the students. But that's especially important when you're flipping the class because you aren't in front of the students able to remind them of the learning objectives. You might as well make things transparent right up front and say, these are the learning objectives on an opening slide. Elisa had a pretty clever idea, and she's organizing her flipped classes where each video is a learning objective. So that way, if students are wondering what the learning objectives are, they just need to look at the, the titles of the, the videos, and they've got them right there. So that's a, a pretty simple, easy tip. When you're making your videos, don't use a terrible Logitech headphone microphone. Go out and buy yourself a decent microphone, something like a, a, a blue snowflake uh, microphone that'll, that'll actually be re relatively good. And then accept reality, your voice really does sound like that. Um, you're the only person that doesn't realize it. And better headphones or better speakers and microphones that won't help you. The students really don't care. They're used to it. Just get on with it. Um, most of my lectures are, are um, droning in disembodied head over PowerPoint. And so uh, the next few tips sort of relate to that. Um, when I 
prepare my lectures, it's you know, slide after slide after slide of, of content, and then I just talk over it. And when I was first making videos, I'd talk, and it, I, it's the way you'd be doing a class. You're in the middle of a paragraph, in a sense, and then you hit the button, and you get the next slide. And then you realize that you have to go back there and edit it. And you change slides in the middle of the sentence that you want to take out, and it's very clumsy. So it took me dozens of videos before I finally figured out that you should put all of your talking on one slide, then stop, then change the slide, then talk so that you can edit. It's especially important if you're using the current version of, of Captivate, which is much clumsier for editing than, than previous versions. It takes a little discipline, but it makes your editing much easier. Um, Another thing I learned that late. Um, so I, I had my course in the can, and it was lecture seven. And, and so I recorded lecture seven, and now I want that to be lecture nine. And I really don't want to re-record the lecture. So I can put little white boxes over things, but, but don't put chapters because your author is going to change the chapters, or you're going to change the book. Just make everything generic. Uh, then you can... You can put titles on the, on the videos and people will think that you did it in order, but that, that's easy to change later. I use a tool called Classroom Presenter and it's mostly the bomb for, for if you're using a PC. It's got some quirks with Office 13 on my computer, but not on Susan Lord's, so I don't know what the deal is. But the wonderful thing about Classroom Presenter, a, it comes out of uh, University of Washington, is that it lets you do this. Uh, in this corner is what I want the students to do. Um, I want them to write the duel for this linear programming problem. Um, that's on the screen that's projected on the wall. Up in the right is what I see. There's text on my screen that they don't get. It has, in the lower left is the solution to the problem, so I look like a savant when I'm explaining what's going on. Up in the right, uh, upper right is a, a, a little reminder to myself of the order in which I want them to do the operation. So if students get stuck in something, I can say, did you like, convert them into the max yet? Um, and, and so that's a useful thing. Um, if I'm doing a video, that's a reminder to me as a cue so I can look at that screen when I'm talking and uh, know what I'm going to say. And when I want to write out the problem on a tablet, I can trace the solution. And I don't actually have to solve it. And I get it right virtually every time. Um, in, in the lower right-hand corner, I have little things that you want to mention, um, you know, amusing anecdotes or whatever. So this is a reminder that uh, when I talk about this SOB method for converting a, a primal to a dual, I want to mention Arthur Benjamin, who's on the math faculty here, because he can multiply six-digit uh, numbers in his head faster than you can pull out your calculator, and he's the guy that came up with this SOB method. So these are little reminders that you want to make sure that you hit. You know, this is a thing that everybody misses on the final. So you can mention that in real time, then not have to say, oh, remember last week? That was something you'll forget on the final. So that's a, a Q-tip classroom presenter. Um, I, would, I would use Windows ME if I had to, to be able to use classroom presenter. It's that good. Um, so one of the things that I did pre-flipping was I created video solutions to homework problems. Students you know, in, in class would say, we want more, more examples. And I'd say, you're not going to get them. So I created videos of me solving problems. It was better than a typed out solution because they can, you can tell them why you are doing something. So I'm reading the problem statement and I see this and that suggests it's not normally distributed so I can't use the normal distribution and, and they might see where the numbers come from. If you don't have the time for do it and you have a grad student, have your grad student do it. Um, if you don't have a grad student, have the students in your class do it. Have them create the videos. Um, after a couple of years, you will have a huge library and students will, will think that they are awesome. Um, if you haven't read it yet, you know, download uh, you know, uh, A Mind for Math by Barbara Oakley. Um, it's a lot of sort of the psychology of, of how people learn and tips for how to learn. Uh, we were talking yesterday a little bit about how you help people who are struggling and get them over the initial hurdles. Um, she is someone who started out with zero ability for math or science and became you know, a, a, an engineering faculty member. So uh, it, it's an awesome book, it's an easy read, and it has a companion Coursera class. It's the most popular class on Coursera, uh, learning how to learn. Make all of your students do that, uh, particularly if you, if you teach intro classes, uh, intro, engineering 101 or something like that. Um, first week on campus, they do this. This Coursera class is four weeks, one hour a week. 
anybody can do it. They'll save an enormous amount of time, and, and, and your students will learn how to learn, and you'll get some ideas for how you might change your class, including this one that I thought of last summer and I'm going to try this semester. We, we know that it's a good idea to, to go back and revisit things that you've learned, but we never do that on homework. It's always homework based on the last lecture that I just gave you. So this semester in, in my problem stats class when I flip it and we do our in-class exercises, some of them are going to be from two or three lectures ago so that they are forced to go back and look at the things they've seen in the past. And they will have to read a problem and say, wait, was this the material from this lecture or from some time in the past? And it's an easy thing to do uh, that, that I, I hope will have some benefits. Um, then the, the last two, uh, if you teach engineering um, and you haven't gone to the National Effective Teaching Institute yet, you should go. I don't care if you taught three years or three decades, you will be better for it. Um, you'll get little tips, you'll get reinforcements, and just sitting in the room for two and a half days thinking about your classes will help. Um, if you aren't an engineer, I'm sorry, uh, th there's probably something comparable in your discipline, but this is a terrific investment uh, of your time. And then that leads to the last idea. Um, as we teach our classes, we sh I think we should try to keep our students in mind uh, the whole time, try to figure out what issues they're dealing with and how we might be able to make their lives a little easier, just in sort of everything we do. But my reminder of that is sort of when, if you have handouts in your class, and I suspect that you all do, um, when you give them handouts, always give them handouts with holes in them. Um, it's a little thing. It costs you nothing, especially if you aren't the one making the handouts. Um, give them to the students. They won't lose them. They'll put them in their binder. It'll be there right away. It's just a, a small thing. And if you have Carly German in your class, when Christmas comes around, she will bring you handmade peppermint bark. So th these, these little things make a difference. And, and if you think hole punch, you'll probably carry that over to the other things you do in your class. speaker this morning is Albert Dato. Hi, uh, I'm Albert. I'm an assistant professor here at Harvey Mudd College. Uh, welcome everyone. i um, so happy to see everyone from all over the country be here today and yesterday. Um, so I have an admission to make. Um, it's my third semester here and I know nothing about flipping a classroom. So with a show of hands, who's flipped a classroom or who has not I'm sorry, who has not flipped a classroom? Good. For those of who have not flipped a classroom, who has, who has made, not made a lecture video? Good. There's still a good chunk of us, right? So um, I attended this conference just because I want to learn more about flipping classrooms because I know nothing about it. And the one thing that I've learned is we have to create content for our students um, that they could look at prior to actually coming to the class time. So I, I, I was really concerned about that because um, I'm 36 years old and um, at least when I was an undergrad, and for those who are older than me or around the same age, when I was an undergrad, um, when you came to class, you had two options. You paid attention or you tried to pay attention or you fell asleep, right? And, uh, but nowadays, you know, students now can pay attention, they can fall asleep, they can go on Facebook, they can go on Netflix, they can do Snapchat, they can go on Twitter. There's so many things we're competing for for their attention in the classroom. So when we're creating content for these students, they just in their dorm rooms or in their apartments, um, we're still competing against the same thing. So creating content is one thing, but creating con good content is another thing because the things that the students can do in a lecture, they could do even worse you know, um, when they're dorm rooms. So they could be watching your video, but if you have a boring video, you know, they, they could easily log on to Facebook and have your video playing in the background or something. So that's was my concern about flipping a classroom. So if I wanted to, so one way to create content is to create videos. Um, oh, wow. So then I said, wow, now I'm going to have to learn how to create videos, and I've never used video editing software before. Oh, boy. So, and another thing is I didn't want a video with just my face on it. I don't think a student wants to see my, fa my, my disembodied head floating on their, their laptop for a good hour, hour and a half, or six minutes, not even three minutes. So one idea that I had is, okay, in my lectures, 
I like to use videos from YouTube. So um, suppose I want to teach a course or a lecture where I'm looking at masses and I'm looking at springs. So the first thing that came to mind is, hey, well, why don't we look at people on pogo sticks? Like, students will want to look at that. So if we can queue up the first video, uh, and we go to the two uh, minute uh, mark. There you go. So here's a guy trying to break last record, record pushed an orange jumping. across the floor of Terminal 4. Uh, okay, wait, why don't I just have 24 that? Minutes and 30 talk seconds. about that. Right? So here's a guy on, on a pogo stick, and I go, all right, well, I was talking to Daryl about this, and, um, and we, were, we were talking about, well, if you want to lecture about something, it would be nice to have your face in the video as well. Now, I didn't want the whole video. I only wanted this 20-second clip of a guy jumping on a pogo stick, and I wanted to talk about it. So I go, all right. So I want this video. I want 10 seconds out of this video, and I want to stick my head in the corner, and I want to narrate this video with my head in the corner. So um, we used Camtasia, and it was surprisingly easy to use. And Daryl sat me down, and in about less than 10 minutes, so if we go to number two, so in less than 10 minutes, what I did was there's a, there's a, there's a 10 second delay. So what Camtasia allows you to take the video, so splice it to what you want, and there's my head on the bottom right. I'm talking to this guy. And I'm and narrating, it's not, it's not a good video. But I was able to actually and, uh, produce this within I'm within 10 minutes of instruction. Technology, and I may so I, I could imagine somewhere. having the pogo yeah, stick, me in the corner, awesome. and then me so let's try that. probably <laughs> you know drawing equations so uh -oh. uh, on the video itself. So then I got hooked. I was like, "Wow, that was super easy to use." So let's queue up video number three. That was super super easy to use. And then and then I started you know my mind just my, my imagination started going well. What if I put in more so than I a few? So then I decided <laughs> I'm going to put, look at all these different systems and masses and springs in them. So and, uh, that now I can go look at all the, look at the world of, of mass and spring and systems. And uh, anyways, I, I couldn't stop. And, and, and I, all of a sudden I was hooked. I was hooked on Camtasia and making content. And uh, the only reason I had to stop was because I wanted to enjoy dinner. Um, but uh, so for those of you who have not made a video, or who have not flipped the classroom, this uh, Camtasia software is actually pretty easy to pick up, and uh, you could really create good content rather quickly. So that's my talk. Thank you. This lightning share out is about exams, or really what to do after an exam. Because so you give the exam, students turn it in, you grade it, and then you can give it back to them, and you can say, well, that's the end of things. But there's really a lot more learning that can happen, and you hope that they're going to be able to learn the material of whatever they missed. So what do you do so that they actually go through the material again? Well, you can post the solutions on the board, on the internet, or whatever, and nobody will look at them. OK, well, that doesn't do you much good. Your, some other options that you've got is that you could go over it and lecture. Well, um, maybe 10% of the students will be paying attention to each of the problems, and so that's not a really good solution either. What I've taken to doing, and seems to work really, really well, is that as the students walk out of the classroom after the exam, I give them another copy of the exam. I also put them into groups of two to three students, depending on how many students they have. And then their assignment is before the next class meeting, is to redo the exam and turn it in. And that will count as a homework grade. They have to do it in partners or groups, however much I give to them. And I usually make the groups up. I'm, I'd assign the groups, putting a strong student and a weak student together and force them to go through this again. The weak student helps us, or is helped by the stronger student. It means that everybody actually is gonna go over the material again, and it's not just they get their grade back, oh, I messed it, put it in the book, close it, and ignore it. So it's something I found really, really helpful. Um, the colleagues at Boise State with whom I've shared this felt that that's really a useful thing, and hopefully some of you will find that as a useful technique to enhance your teaching too. Thank you.